Uh, the entire agenda of tonight's meeting will be given over to a panel discussion entitled The Public Employees Negotiation Law and Its Implications for ISU Faculty. We have with us tonight a distinguished panel of experts on the subject and our moderator will introduce them shortly. Before proceeding with the introductions, however, I should like to emphasize that the purpose of tonight's meeting is to gather information, not to conduct business. Accordingly, the chair will rule out of order any motion uh, except that to adjourn. Uh, any motions regarding uh, council action on collective bargaining, of course, will be in order at the appropriate time on the agenda at our next regular meeting a week from tonight at, in the Memorial Union Gallery. Because of the great potential impact that the passage of a collective bargaining bill could have upon the faculty of Iowa State University, the status of the collective bargaining bill in the Iowa legislature has been of concern to faculty council for about a year. Last year, the bill was monitored by the Faculty and Administration Relations Committee of Faculty Council, of which I was chairman. During the summer, as it became apparent that a collective bargaining bill probably would eventually pass the Iowa legislature, the Faculty Council Executive Committee recommended that the question be taken out of the jurisdiction of the Faculty Administration Relations Committee, not because we didn't think they'd do a good job, but because they already had a very heavy study load for this year. And we further recommended that this issue be assigned to the Long Range Planning Committee of Faculty Council. This committee, chaired by Norman Boyles, has been studying this matter since September and has arranged tonight's panel discussion. In my own mind, there are a number of unresolved questions that need answers. I invite the council to join me tonight in seeking the answers to these questions. First of all, some general questions. One, what is collective bargaining? Two, why is collective bargaining coming to college and university campuses? Three, what have been the results on college and university campuses where the faculties have engaged in collective bargaining? A, what have been the favorable results, if any? B, what have been the unfavorable results, if any? Four, on balance, does the faculty gain or lose by bargaining collectively? To be more specific, in referring to Iowa's Senate File 531, one, what are the main pro provisions of Senate File 531? Two, how would it affect the faculty at Iowa State University? Three, what would be the results at Iowa State University if the faculty were to engage in collective bargaining? A, what would be the favorable results, if any? B, what would be the unfavorable results, if any? Four, on balance, would the faculty gain or lose by the passage of Senate File 531 and by bargaining collectively according to its provisions. To be even more specific in referring to faculty council, should faculty council make some statement regarding Senate File 531 that might have some influence during the forthcoming debate in the Iowa House? Since such a statement would bear on a subject which has a substantial component external to the university, and since the newly amended basic document of faculty council prevents the council from speaking or communicating on legal, religious, commercial, <laughs> private, or public policy matters outside the university, the council would, I think, be required to take such a statement to the general faculty for its endorsement. I hope that tonight's panelists will assist the council in finding the answers to these questions, that is, in helping us to do our homework on this issue. At this point, I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of tonight's panel discussion. He is professor of education and director of teacher placement. He has served faculty council in the past as its chairman and currently serves as chairman of its long range planning committee. Our moderator, Norman Boyles. I'll uh, try to set the rules a bit. I don't think we need very many, but uh, and then introduce our panel members and we can get started. Uh, Suppose I introduce our, mem our panel members first. On my far right is uh, John, or as I prefer, Jack uh, Whitmer, who is in the political science department and has uh, currently been doing some work, some research, uh, as it were, uh, in, uh, uh, with local government programs as it refers to collective bargaining. So we hope he'll be able to share some of that with us uh, tonight. Uh, on my immediate right is uh, State Senator John Murray, who uh, I think the proper term is managed the bill on the floor of the Senate last year, and uh, he will start off our presentation in a moment. On my immediate left is uh, Reed Crawford, a state representative who will 
find it his task to vote, I assume, on this bill pretty soon in the House of Representatives. So um, those three, and then the last I, I introduced to you is a man, is a very timely man. I tried for uh, some two weeks to get a hold of him, and I had just about given up, and I was racking my brain as to who, whom I might get to replace him, and I said, I'm going to place one more telephone call. <laughs> And I got him out of bed, and he answered and uh, agreed to come, and we're so pleased that he did. This is Ray Bailey, member of the Board of Regents, and uh, he will speak from a uh, slightly different perspective. Uh, some of his own personal thoughts and also reflect the Board of Regents' present uh, stance as it relates to collective bargaining. I'm going to ask that, uh, as I've indicated, uh, John Murray to start to review the bill and uh, some particular things that he would like to discuss with us about it. Then I'm going to ask Reed Crawford to pick up on some of the amendments and issues and concerns he has with this particular bill. Jack Whitmer will be third, and I've already mentioned his uh, particular approach, and Ray Bailey will be fourth, as I've already indicated, uh, and his particular uh, perspective. I'd like for us to hold our questions until they're finished, unless between one you have some question that you'd like to clarify a point. I'd, I'd rather we didn't get into too many questions between each of the presentations. We've asked that uh, each of them uh, shoot for something like 10 minutes, and uh, we'll proceed after that to entertain questions from the floor. Uh, maybe, do any of you have comments before we start? Uh, then in that case, I'll... Uh, Turn it over to you then, John. Thank you, Norm. The issue is, as I see, uh, the whole area of Senate File 531, which is what we're talking about, is uh, to Im the improvement of employer-employee relations in the public sector. Uh, to me, I think improvement is needed. Um, I had some experience, admittedly not in a university setting, in the governor's office for a year and three quarters. Uh, I felt very definitely at that point that we needed to have some structure for employee-employer empl uh, relations. Uh, some of the reasons why I feel that improvement is needed. First, we need to approach employee compensation, the whole scheme of compensation, in a comprehensive manner. Uh, secondly, to me, we must treat public employees and employers, their views, with dignity and respect. And I'm afraid in many cases around this state, public employees are not getting their views or their persons viewed with respect. A third reason that I see improvement is needed is that Although we do have a structure now for negotiation, that structure is informal, in many cases archaic, and to me, we need to formalize that structure. At the same time, I see several other critical factors hemming in here. First, I think we need to maintain the public's control of general state and educational policy through the ballot box. We need also to retain the element of a voluntary and permissive nature to employer-employee relations. We have a history of, of voluntariness, permissiveness in the labor movement here in Iowa, um, in labor management relations, Unions in the private sector work under those rules. We need to maintain uh, that element in the imp our approach to employer-employee relations. With that brief introduction of the issue as I see it, I'd like to get right down to the bill, which is Senate File 531. Uh, incidentally, I have, a, I have a copy here, as I'm sure other uh, members of the panel do of the retyped Senate File 531 after we adopted seven amendments on the floor of the Senate last May. There are about six or seven 
important points that I want to underscore about this bill. First, its voluntary or permissive nature. I'd like to emphasize two factors on Senate File 531 that, to me, are voluntary. First, the bargaining required through this stru structure only comes about if the employees file a petition and hold an election. By filing a petition, that means that 30 percent of the employees within that bargaining unit, and for the purpose of discussion tonight, I assume we'll take bargaining unit as being uh, a portion or all of the faculty here at Iowa State. 30 percent of the members of that bargaining unit, all of the faculty, would have to sign a petition saying that they would like this particular employee organization, whatever it is, to represent them in collective bargaining. Or they would also have to be members, or they wouldn't also, or they would have to be members of that particular organization. Then there must be an election, and that ele election must turn up 50 percent or 50.1 percent of the vote in support of collective bargaining of this particular employee organization. One of the choices in that vote is no representation. In other words, maintaining the same bargaining structure or negotiation structure that you have right now. It's voluntary. It's voluntary for the employees, but if the employees seek to bargain and they petition and they vote over 50 percent to bargain, then it's not voluntary on the employer. Let's face it, the employer holds all the cards right now. The employees have little in terms of, of actual power. So that it's voluntary in terms of the employees. The second factor in the voluntariness is that the first order of business, once it becomes mandatory upon the parties to bargain, is in the negotiation process to sit down and agree on their own impasse procedures. They set up their own impasse procedures between the employer, we'll say the administration here at Iowa State, and the employee organization or those representatives of the faculty here at Iowa State. Only if there is no agreement on impasse procedures, on the way to go about negotiating, does this bill and the provisions of this bill in the impasse area take effect. A second important area of the, of the bill is the creation of the Public Employment Relations Board. This board, we, the bill sets up as quasi-judicial and very professional. It's a full-time board of three members. They're responsible for collecting data, assisting both sides on, uh, on providing data on how to go about negotiations. And a very important aspect of their job is the interpretation of this particular law, interpretation of the scope interpretation of the employee rights, employer rights, and all other aspects. A third important area of the bill I put under the heading of personnel covered. The attempt was to cover all public employees, state and local. Now, there are a number of exceptions made to that. Supervisory personnel, confidential personnel, those, uh, those personnel, assistants, uh, secretaries, clerks, uh, who participate in the negotiation process from the side of the employer. It, it was felt that we shouldn't have people being on both sides of the fence. Obviously, higher education is included under this bill. A structure, uh, a fourth area, a structure is provided in this bill for bargaining. Uh, there is a requirement uh, if an employee organization is formed and elected out of the bargaining unit, a requirement on both parties to bargain in good faith. There are rights provided for the employer 
and for the employees. Certain prohibited practices are spelled out, which most importantly, the parties are uh, mandated to bargain in good faith. A fifth area, the scope of the negotiation. That's a very controversial area, and you'll probably be hearing much more about that in the days and months to come. The bill spells out wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. Some say that this is a very broad scope, and in some ways, maybe it is, in comparison to just uh, a scope that would stipulate just wages. I would suggest that it is narrowly defined to include those legitimate interests of a working person, of an employee. The attempt is to exclude general public policy or educational policy from this area. A sixth area, strikes are prohibited and rather severe penalties are provided in the bill. A seventh area, impasse procedures are provided. I would again underscore the fact that those procedures take effect only if the parties cannot come to an agreement themselves uh, on the type of negotiation procedures and impasse procedures that they would like to institute between themselves. The impasse procedures provided, there's a small section for fact-finding and mediation. The attempt uh, to provide the Public Employment Relations Board uh, with the authority to have a list of mediators and then another very controversial section of the bill, which would be final offer arbitration. The attempt here is to provide an, ar uh, an arbitration remedy, uh, a remedy that is short of a strike, but that encourages both of the parties to come up with their most reasonable offers. Now, I'm not a labor management expert. Um, I've, I must say I've been sold on the final offer arbitration as being a very good procedure. Uh, in a sense, what it is is that if they cannot reach an agreement uh, by 95 days prior to the budget submission date, then they must submit their last and final offer to an arbitration panel. And that arbitration panel cannot, uh, cannot compromise on those offers. That panel can, has three choices, can choose uh, the final offer of the employer, the final offer of the employee uh, organization, or can say neither offer is reasonable and send them back to get a second set of final offers. Now, all the time that these arbitrators are meeting, the employee organization and the employer can also be meeting in further negotiation, can come up with a resolution of their conflict prior to the resolution by the arbitrators. I would say, and many of you have undoubtedly read William Boyd's article, The Impact of Collective Bargaining on University Governance, in the AGB reports. Uh, I'd like to, as a, <coughs> as a conclusion, run down a couple of the items that William Boyd talks about in the effect that he sees collective bargaining has on higher education. Uh, first, he says, and I'm, I'm sure other members of the panel can, ex can expound on these items, he says that governance in a university will tend to become more centralized, more formal and legalized, tend to become more uniform, uh, that departmental autonomy will be reduced, that deans and department heads will have less control over the appointments, promotions, and terminations. Uh, that goes along, obviously, with more centralization, more uniformity. And third, and very important, students will have even less effect on, in the employment conditions area uh, than they have now. Uh, 
I wanted to list those off because I, I thought you must, you must consider these as you consider the bill. But I want to reemphasize that the bill is voluntary and that the faculty can vote not to have employment organization here. In fact, the, you can't even, you can stop it short of an election by not having 30% of the faculty uh, be interested in negotiation. I would like to quote the final two sentences from President Boyd's article. It is important to remember that collective bargaining is not a cause of our troubles, but merely one means of attempting to solve problems which have vexed faculty and administrators alike. Educational leaders today face the challenge of providing alternative solutions or of working to accommodate the techniques of collective bargaining to academic values in ways which will minimize any adverse impact. In final conclusion, I, apparently all of us want good employer-employee relations. I certainly do. Senate File 531 is the Iowa Senate's best efforts as of last May to find a resolution to this problem. Hopefully, maybe we can work together tonight and in the future to provide the best structure for all. Okay, I, I, what is a unit again? The bargaining unit is the unit in which uh, an employee organization will bargain with an employer. For example, it's, the faculty? For example, the faculty. We do not set out bargaining units within the bill, but we ask the Public Employment Relations Board, the, what we hope will be a professional and quasi-judicial board, to establish bargaining units on the basis of several criteria one of which is geography, another is a, a common sense of purpose, and, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, there are several others. But it would be fair to say the faculty, probably. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Reed? What John explained to you was the history of, of Senate File 531, and we as members of the House are still working with this history with this history. Of course, now for us, it's the present. And what John was, was mentioning just right at the end, I think is extremely important, especially when one considers the interest groups that have played a particularly important role in the writing of this bill and in the proposing of amendments for this bill. Very little input has come from the higher educational institutions, at least in my experience and from the contact. And only recently, have I started to receive letters saying that they're possibly concerned about a particular aspect of this bill, they'd like to see an amendment written, or that um, they like this particular aspect and they'd like to see it included. And so I think this is one thing that John and I are looking forward to because um, just because it's done with the Senate, let me assure you, it is going back to the Senate because the House will not mm -hmm. pass this bill in its, in its present state. I just, I know it won't. And so uh, both houses will be uh, dealing with this bill. My we're, task we're, to we're very happy in the Senate to have the House clean up some of the legislation <laughs> that we passed. We always have to do that. <laughs> it's particularly difficult trying to find out and trying to determine what the amendments are going to be on Senate File 531. Because two weeks from tomorrow, it's a special order of business and the House will put aside everything else and will start debating collective bargaining for public employees. So with this two-week deadline rapidly approaching and this deadline being known to every member in the House since, well, since I believe the end of, of May, you'd think that the amendments would still would be in there and would be able to be working on them and, and starting to get our vote totals. This has not been the case. Amendments are still being proposed and they're still being drafted and people are still trying to find out where the greatest number of, of people are, are lining up. So if I could, I'd like to go through the bill discussing some of the amendments at the, at the same time. I think we'll bring out the more controversial aspects, reemphasizing the, the aspects that John brought up. And I'll try to point out some of the arguments both for and against it and probably throw in my opinion. 
as is most often the case in, in most controversial, controversial bills, I'm sure there will be an amendment that will strike the entire bill and provide for a completely different concept. And this would be a, a meet, and conf, meet and confer concept. Now, this is not completely different, but it is uh, faculty, public employees are able to meet and confer according to a, uh, a recent court decision. Uh, it was a UNI related to some UNI employees, a recent court decision. And so we currently, public employees have the right to meet and confer with their employers. And so this will be one amendment that, uh, that will be offered. Other amendments that will be offered, one of these has to do with definitions. And one of these has to do, which I'm sure you, as faculty members, are very much interested in, would be a definition of professionals, professional employees. Taking this one step further, getting beyond the question of uh, definitions, there is uh, one amendment that would be offered that would mandate that professional employees and other employees be in separate bargaining units. So immediately right here, just when we deal with professional employees, we have two amendments. Another amendment will exclude anyone from coverage who does not work full time. I believe one amendment that will be debated, and, and I'm predicting it will pass, is a whole area of public employer rights. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if, if John went over this or not in his presentation, but it, he, there is two sections, section seven and section eight. Section seven deals with public employer rights. Section eight deals with public employee rights. There's a belief on the part of uh, many of us that possibly the public employer rights need to be more specifically spelled out. Some that have been suggested, I'll just read through a couple of these. One, to contract or subcontract for work. Determine the health, safety, and proper, uh, property protection measures necessary. Determine who shall receive merit increases and when merit increases shall be received. Determine the necessity of overtime and the amount of overtime required. These are just a few that are being suggested for additional employer rights. The bargaining unit determination within this bill is left up in conjunction with the, the local employees to the Public Employment Relations Board, the PER Board. One amendment that will be offered will set out certain bargaining units. Some that are listed right here, A, the Board of Regents, B, Department of Social Services, C, the Highway Commission. This would mean that the, this, it would be stating within this bill that the bargaining unit for Board of Regents employees would be as Board of Regents employees and they would be bargaining with the Board of Regents. It would not be, it would not be as if the, uh, the faculty of Iowa State University would be bargaining directly with uh, Iowa State University administration persons. And then the, another unit uh, that is being proposed is collectively all other boards, commissions, agencies, and departments. Now I should stress these amendments that I've gathered over the past couple of days, these are just amendments. None of these have been filed as of yet, but it's, uh, it's the intent of, of most of the sponsors of the people talking about these to offer these. Another portion of the bill which bothers me, and I, and I don't believe this is the Senate's intent, is the whole idea of Section uh, 28A of the code. And Section 28A of the code is the public meeting section of our code stating that um, our public agencies, which we're currently having a problem with with certain aspects of, of Iowa State, would be, uh, would be required to meet in public. And as it's provided for in the bill, negotiating sessions, mediation, and deliberative process of arbiters, arbitrator, excuse me, will be exempt from the provisions 28A of the code, of 28A of the code. There's an amendment that will be proposed that will include the hearings to be exempt from 28A, and another provision that would be exempt, say I'm more familiar in this particular case with the school boards, but the school boards can only meet in private session to determine, to talk about uh, 
own measures having to do with, with personnel and siting, I believe, are the, are the two uh, exceptions. And um, I think if you can put yourself in the situation of the school board, it really wouldn't be quite too fair sitting as a, as a member of the school board talking about what one would, would offer in a negotiating session with the meeting open to the public and obviously teachers being there. And it's, uh, I think this takes away from uh, the, the fairness of Senate File 531. I don't believe this was the intent of the, of the Senate when they did this, and so I believe this also will be, uh, will be an amendment that will be cleared up. And another amendment that will be offered will uh, change the effective date of this bill to uh, one year later, making it go effective in uh, 1975 instead of this instead of this summer. Now let me stress though, this summer, if this bill passes, say for instance, in its exact form, if this bill passes right now, that does not mean that people will immediately start bargaining the next day after this goes into effect. This is not the case. There will be a time period in which the bargaining units are determined, in which employee organizations will get organized, in which employer groups will get organized. And so there is a, about a year of preparation for this particular bill. Another amendment, and this amendment is not too widely known, at least among the members of the House, speaking generally, and, and possibly uh, Mr. Bailey can speak to this, is an amendment that would exempt faculty members from the provisions of Senate File 531. John went over some of the reasons that some people believe that faculty should be exempt. But at the same time, when this amendment is offered, there's a, a second provision with this stating how the Board of Regents would deal with uh, the whole idea of collective bargaining so that it, it would not be setting Board of Regents employees off or faculty members off in a separate category. It would be setting up a sort of a separate type procedure. Again, I'm operating at a, at a disadvantage because this amendment has not been, been drawn up, but I want to make sure that you, you knew that this was a, this was a possibility. Another provision will strike the whole idea of final offer arbitration. I find it hard to accept right now the final offer arbitration, and as it's provided for in the bill, each side will offer final off offer, and if the arbitrators do not accept this, this, this first final offer, then they will say, go at it one more time, and then the second time, the arbitrators have to accept either one of these final offers. And let me stress that they can take uh, it isn't as if, as if it's a package. They can take different pieces out of the package. It's so, for instance, say that uh, uh, the employer organization uh, offered a 40-hour uh, a week, $10,000 uh, a year salary, and the employee organization, their final offer was, was 14,035 hours a week. Then the, uh, the arbitrators could pick, say, the uh, the $10,000 and the, and the 35 hours, so they can pick between these packages. What one amendment will do will be to strike this provision for final offer arbitration. I personally believe that, that arbitrators should be able to, to recommend not have to choose between the final offer and be able to, to go in between in the, in the judgment of the, uh, of the arbitrators, though I understand the reasoning that was used behind this, and that's to ensure good faith bargaining on the parts of, of both units within this uh, negotiating session and place in, its, in place of this final offer arbitration the provision for fact finding. Another provision provides for if an individual were to strike, even though strikes are prohibited, it would prohibit that individual from receiving any benefits from his or her participation in the strike. Say that a particular benefit was granted by the employer organization as a result of the strike. Because that individual participated in that strike, she, he or she would not be able to receive that benefit. That's, those are the amendments that I believe are going to be offered as of this afternoon at about 4 o'clock. Tomorrow, I could be completely wrong in the in the number or the uh, or the or the size of these. I would like to uh, just throw out a couple figures, and primarily to uh, prompt your your thinking on this and to 
to get me thinking in, in a particular area the way that you feel on this. And that's uh, from the, uh, the Chronicle on, on higher of Higher Education. And this was uh, November 26, issue 1973. It states that 212 college and university faculties have collective bargaining agents. And uh, of these 212, 40 of these are four-year institutions. Uh, primarily, most of these are community colleges. And most of these would be uh, in the Northeast, Wisconsin, Illinois. And so it's, uh, I would like to have you think about it and possibly either let me know at this meeting or, or later on why you think only such a, a small number. And let me state that the names that, that immediately come to mind as far as, as major and large universities are not included within this, um, within this group. Admittedly, I'm not up to date on probably the finest educational institutions within our, within our nation, but the, the big name institutions just aren't there, and I'd like to hear some input on possibly why they're not. Thank you. Okay. Since this was a, a faculty council meeting, I thought probably the first approach I would try to take would be to hit on about three of what I feel the issues that would be of primary interest uh, to the faculty members, and then come back and try to take a look at the, the concept of collective bargaining uh, kind of from an analytical approach. I think uh, some of these things have been touched on before, but let me try to put them in a, a kind of a personal context. First of all, how will public sector collective bargaining is provided in Senate File 531, and this is the only thing that we have to go on right now, affect you as a member of the Iowa State faculty? Uh, I'm kind of interested uh, to hear Reed report on the amendments. Uh, I do function as a part of Iowa State University Extension, and some of the things that we've talked about in visiting across the state about the fallacy of the bills I, I see are showing up in the amendments, so it, it does kind of make you feel good that the communications process does work. First of all, under 531, uh, you will be a public employee. In other words, there's no question that you're covered by the, the law. You will be able to form, join, and do those things that are necessary to participate in an employee organization. Uh, you will be able to engage in what they call concerted activities, but you may not strike. Now, you may refuse to join any employee organization, including refusing to uh, pay the dues. But you may be represented by an organization, whether you want to or not, if it wins the election. Now, as they pointed out, when they petition for the election, they have to have 30 percent. After the initial petition is filed, then any organization that can raise 10 percent can also be on a ballot, along with the issue that we have no representation at all. Now, if there is more than two uh, organizations or items uh, on the ballot and there is not a clear majority winner, in other words, you cannot have a plurality winner, then there must be a runoff election. And the winner of that runoff, it's a winner-take-all proposition. And when we come back and talk about the identification of the unit, as they both indicated, this will be up to the determination of the board. Now, it could be the Board of Regents institutions, it could be Iowa State University, it could be tenured professors, uh, it could be about any identification of a unit uh, that they would approve. Now, we have no way of knowing what that particular board will approve as a unit. But if the election is conducted in that unit, you are a part of it, and the organization wins, you will be represented by it whether you choose to or not. Now, if you are represented by an organization, you can still go to your employer individually with your grievances or with any problems that you have provided that the organization be so notified that you're going to do this, and then if there are any lateral agreements made that they be in compliance with the general agreement between the employee organization and the employer. So I think that this kind of touches uh, on those aspects that would uh, govern you personally. Now, I think that we'd have to get into a little bit of uh, theory and analysis if we would do attempt to answer the question, how will the decision-making uh, apparatus of Iowa State University be affected. 
but I think it's fair to say that in the area of personnel policy that this will be a negotiated area rather than strictly a unilateral decision, uh, possibly as it is now on the part of management. Now it is interesting that neither side must agree or make a concession. Or finally, if the employer finds that they've agreed to something that in fact then they can't raise the money for, they are obligated only to try in good faith to raise the money. If it's not there, uh, there seems to be some doubt as to about what will happen. Now, when they get together uh, and negotiate, part of the agreement is that they must both agree to participate in the results of the impasse resolution procedure. And I think probably this is really the, the gut issue of 531. Uh, I was interested in Reed's concept of final offer arbitration uh, that they could pick points. Uh, this is a little bit contrary to the theory of final offer arbitration and I'd like to just kind of point out here as to why some people uh, say that it is better than regular uh, negotiation. But let's just talk a minute about how can we resolve an impasse. First of all, I think you can have a unilateral power decision, which is the way some people say that it operates now. Management makes a decision. They may listen uh, sympathetically for a while, but finally they say, all right, this is the way that it's going to be. If they have the power, that particular decision sticks. Another way, of course, is the so-called economic power move, which includes the strike or the lockout on the part of the employer. Now, I think we ought to point out that at least the direct economic impact or muscle of a strike is not available to public employees. A school district in New Jersey proved, for example, that if they were deep in debt, it was worthwhile to agitate their employees to go on strike because the real estate taxes, the sales taxes, the state appropriations continued to come in while the employees were out on strike. When they came back, they were out of debt, and then they were able to go back at it. So now I'm not saying that there aren't some economic implications, political implications, but the direct economic muscle for public employees from the area of strike is really not there. All right, the other issue then is the communications, mediation, conciliation, and then finally arbitration or binding arbitration aspect that is included in, in 531. Now, final offer arbitration, at least in theory, is somewhat unique in that it is set up to the point that, as uh, John alluded to, that you'll never reach arbitration because it's definitely a zero-sum game. Let's say that the employee and the employer had 20 items uh, that they were going to negotiate on and they could agree on 12. They set the 12 off to the side after the negotiation period and then they make a final offer on the eight. Now the final offer does not only go to the arbitration panel, which uh, one person is picked by the employee group and another, the other person is picked by the employer and those two pick the chairman or the neutral. But the final offer also goes to the other party so that they can continue the negotiation. Now the theory behind it is that, you know, both sides are, are reasonably smart and they can take a look at the other side's final offer and if it looks more reasonable than theirs, they hurry up and make an amended final offer so that theirs is in fact more reasonable than the other parties. Well, if this continues to go on, you can see that what they're doing is promoting the continuation of communications and negotiations, and in fact, the issues will be resolved by this method rather than going to final offer arbitration. Now, if, as Reed interprets final offer arbitration, the arbitration board can pick and choose among, say, those remaining eight items and mix them up or mix up parts uh, of these items, then it's kind of a smorgasbord and it seems to me that the theory of final offer arbitration uh, doesn't have the, the positive aspects, at least that they write up in the textbooks. Now, what has happened in final offer arbitration, I suppose if it is a game, is that if both sides de are determined to be stubborn and bullheaded, uh, their initial final offers can be absolutely ridiculous. They can be rejected and literally resubmitted in this completely a ridiculous form, and then it is not picking the most reasonable final offer, but it is picking the least unreasonable final offer, and recognizing that the arbitrators then leave town, and it's still the two parties that are then left to try to make the system work. And so in theory, it sounds, if it's a package deal, that maybe it will hold 
uh, everybody's feet to the fire to continue the negotiation process, uh, but this really hasn't been the situation. All right, maybe this has uh, responded to a couple of um, uh, Lem's questions as to why and what and so forth. And now I'd like to spend just a couple minutes, I suppose, on from an analytical point of view. Uh, our approach, at least in, in working in extension education, that is that collective bargaining is neither good nor bad. Uh, it is a tool. It is a dimension of labor management relations. Uh, I've used the analogy that it's like fire. Uh, depending upon how you guide it and apply it, the results can be either good or bad. Uh, certainly they can be used and abused. Uh, I think that the, the context that we need to look at this in is that we have an organization, and in public employment, particularly a university, it's different than the private sector. But this organization meets the needs of a number of different segments. Uh, it meets the needs of the people that manage the organization. It meets the needs of the people that work for the organization. It meets the needs of the people that consume the product of the organization. And hopefully it meets the needs of the people who have to pay the bill to, to operate this organization. Now, if an organization meets the particular and individual needs of these four groups completely, there's not going to be any desire to change any of the relationships or the dimensions or the perimeters within which this organization functions. But if for some reason those things are not met, then of course there's going to be a movement to try to change it. And what areas uh, do they feel, I suppose, that are most important? Well, one is communications. They want the communications to go up as well as down, that a person can make inputs into the organization without fear of reprisal. They want some type of a quasi-democratic arrangement to adopt the rules that govern their behavior. Uh, rather than a unilateral arrangement where somebody superimposes the rules onto the group, all groups, as far as we're concerned. And then finally, they need to have some framework with which to resolve conflict. Again, if these criteria are met for the most part for all of these groups within a particular organization, then again, no one's going to be initiating a movement to change the aspects of the organization. So I suppose where we do have a bill submitted in the legislature, uh, one of the things that we would have to look at in Iowa State University, Board of Regents institutions, are in what of these areas are, are the needs not being met and why not? And then take a look at the alternatives and ask the question, you know, is a law, Senate File 531 or that law and its amendments, uh, you know, the best way or a practical way at meeting the needs or bringing the needs closer to this type of an analytical model. Now, uh, I don't know if that's helped set the framework or not, but uh, this is the way that we've tried to take a look at the situations for other units of, of public agencies uh, to help them understand it. Thank you, John. Bailey? Mr. Moderator all panelists and, and members of the faculty of a really great, in my judgment, university. I think probably uh, uh, first uh, I should uh, <coughs> explain uh, how it was that I was called out of bed. <coughs> <laughs> that uh, might sound like Regent's sleep uh, late or something, but I think I'd gone to bed about uh, four o'clock uh, that morning. We'd gotten back in, into town. Uh, another point I should make uh, preliminary is that, that um, I do speak as an individual. I do not uh, officially represent the Board of Regents. Uh, on the other hand, I am going to in a moment uh, uh, allude to the um, uh, last action, the action taken at the last board meeting with reference to a position on collective bargaining with reference to faculty. <clears throat> and I would like to express uh, my real appreciation uh, for having this opportunity to be here because of the fact that um, the board, uh, I really have two reasons, and they'll both become apparent, I think, as I proceed. But the board 
was very concerned at taking the action that it did. It felt the need for expressing its concern, but it was felt uh, that uh, it might possibly be misunderstood uh, in, in taking any action of this type of, of expressing even a concern, lest the faculty feel uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the faculties of the respective universities feel that the board uh, was in some way opposing them. Actually, I think you'll see that we are uh, supporting you in our judgment uh, very, very greatly because in our judgment uh, we are well aware uh, that uh, uh, to have a uh, great university we have to have a great faculty and we're convinced that uh, to have a collective bargaining uh, for faculties is a step in the wrong direction as far as that's concerned uh, both as uh, far as the individual faculty members are concerned and as far as the university is concerned. So that is, uh, is one of the uh, reasons that I'm particularly happy uh, to have been invited. And the other is uh, to uh, give you an opportunity to have information that we do have, uh, which, uh, that which uh, as you'll see, I have particularly uh, happened to have been exposed to that um, uh, may uh, cause you to take whatever action you see fit, either individually or collectively, uh, with reference to the bill, as has been invited by, by the legislators. Uh, I'll read uh, to you uh, this uh, motion uh, that, uh, as it was passed uh, at the uh, last uh, meeting of the board, Mr. Slife moved that the Board of Regents express its concern about uh, including faculty of the three Regents universities in the general public employee bargaining bill because the bill seems inconsistent with the professional status of faculty members and their role in establishing educational policy. It may be that separate legislation designed to meet the special circumstances of the faculty student institutional relationship would be preferable. Uh, Mr. Zumba seconded and the motion passed with one dissent. There were two abs, uh, there were two people absent. <clears throat> As I've indicated a, a bit ago, I have had some concerns. It, it just seemed to me uh, that uh, the uh, Reducing uh, professional people, and incidentally, uh, for uh, Reed's and, and John's uh, benefit particularly, uh, the statement of the original board position, the original statement of board position that refers to professionals was not intended to cover faculty. That is, in other words, as I told Norm in the telephone conversation, I think that was one reason that the uh, wording of the um, uh, title for the discussion tonight was changed somewhat is that, that uh, this was something that was specifically discussed and as a matter of fact uh, before uh, we acted on this original statement of uh, position uh, we eliminated all reference to faculty uh, in order that there be no implication that we were ex assuming that faculty would be covered so that uh, uh, the word professional is intended to cover such people as, as uh, technicians and uh, particularly in, in the medical and, and uh, health sciences and that sort of thing. I, I just, uh, so basically, this new statement is not in any way in conflict with the original. It's just a, a, a sub, uh, further uh, uh, statement of, or clarification of position. But I was in attendance at a workshop uh, out uh, in a national conference of the American Association of Governing Boards in San Francisco this past spring. And in this workshop, uh, a man got up and identified himself as uh, the um, former, as a member of the Board of Trustees of uh, Central Michigan State uh, University. And he said that he was chairman of the board 
of the trustees at the time that uh, that board entered into a collective bargaining agreement with the faculty. And he said that, that uh, they haven't let him near the chairmanship since. He said that they have recently, at that time, had an accrediting agency in to uh, their complete university, and that the accrediting agency had stated that the university has recent, uh, correction, that, that the, uh, the, the accrediting agency concluded that the faculty is mediocre with little dedication to or interest in scholarship, that they make no effort to improve themselves. And he went on to say that the inclination is for the good faculty members to leave the university and go elsewhere. His final conclusion was that collective bargaining with faculty uh, has been very de detrimental as far as, as its effect on higher education quality is concerned. Then at uh, uh, a meeting of the Iowa Coordinating Council for Post uh, High School Education, which occurred uh, the 3rd of January of this year, just uh, within uh, slightly more than a month now, the president of uh, the, the man that John was referring to and, and quoting from there, John, uh, in, from this AGB article, uh, this man was at uh, the meeting and addressed uh, those present. And he described himself uh, as a liberal. Incidentally, I might say that uh, uh, he was a former faculty member, too, at uh, University of Michigan. And uh, he was now, uh, is now president of uh, Central Michigan State. And he described himself as a liberal. But, uh, and he, he looked the part, I might say, uh, but uh, uh, he, uh, 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 quite obviously, from some of these comments that I'm going to read to you, uh, does not feel uh, that uh, uh, collective bargaining is compatible with good professional uh, stature as far as faculty members are concerned. I'm going to read uh, a number of quotes from um, notes that were taken uh, by somebody from the board office, uh, and then I'll refer to a couple that I made myself, uh, at least one. But uh, this Dr. William Boyd, now I, you want to be sure that you don't confuse him with Willard Boyd, uh, the uh, president of, of the University of Iowa, of course, but, uh, and apparently they're, they're no relation. I guess well, they've never met, as far as I know. But in any event, uh, this is one of the comments. Change in tone in the quality of campus life, adversarial instead of collegial, new conflicts between the faculty, as well as between the faculty and the administration. Unions tend to disapprove of faculty senates. Now remember, this is a man that's had several years of experience uh, with uh, collective bargaining. Further loss of autonomy by the governing boards and uh, legislators, correction, uh, further loss of autonomy by the institution as the governing boards and legislators move to protect money from being bargained away from educational resources. Another point, academic freedom becomes more vulnerable. For example, when tenure is bargained away. And uh, I believe in the same issue read of, of uh, the um, uh, Chronicle, as uh, you have th that uh, sheet from uh, on the front page, it uh, shows that, that the uh, faculty of the University of Hawaii uh, had bargained part of their tenure away, uh, had uh, cut down, cut it back anyway. Another point he made, loss uh, in uh, institutional quality as uh, merit systems are replaced by more uniform distribution of salaries. Decline in the weeding out of mediocre faculty resulting in instant tenure. And that was a point that he also made that uh, he felt that the Iowa bill as presently written would in effect 
give instant tenure to uh, people who <coughs> have been on the payroll a month, presumably, or on the faculty. Also, that it would incre increase the um, uh, student-faculty ratio. You'd have larger classes. Another point that he made, changing from a situation characterized by de jure power by the governing board to de facto power being spread out among many. That is, in other words, uh, we all know, presumably, that the uh, statute that sets up the Board of Regents and provides for control of the universities and so on places in the Board of Regents the power that um, uh, uh, is required for uh, governing the three uh, universities. But as a matter of fact, we also are all aware, as, uh, including the board members, I might say, of the fact that actually a great deal of input and governance comes from uh, the institution itself and principally from the faculty. And what uh, the tendency is, is for, as bargaining proceeds, uh, for uh, the actual uh, de jure the law uh, provisions to become effective and become reality and for the power to uh, be uh, weaned away from uh, the faculties, which they have held uh, under just this uh, more or less informal arrangement. It says that uh, uh, even the governing boards uh, eventually lose this power because uh, the uh, inclination is for the power to eventually go even outside of the governing board uh, to outside agencies, including uh, the um, legislature, for example. And, uh, well, I might as well point it out right now. It was one of the items in my own notes. but. Uh, the uh, uh, problem, uh, to a very substantial extent, is uh, that uh, the negotiating is done uh, by uh, unions, uh, which uh, uh, initially it may start out as a local union, as an institution union, but that's usually affiliated with a national organization, and the national organization is the one that, that uh, finally does the dictating, uh, with the result uh, that uh, you have what really amount to academic decisions being made by these labor people who know probably very little about the needs of uh, state universities and have uh, probably no uh, orientation whatever uh, with uh, the state of Iowa. So you see uh, these things just Aren't, don't work out, and it seems to me that, that an important aspect of this is that, that this is what uh, experience, or what I guess I would refer to as, as a type of education, uh, is teaching us, and, and it seems to me that we uh, would be uh, ill-advised if we uh, fail to at least consider uh, these uh, uh, factors. One of the uh, last statements that uh, Dr. Boyd made uh, was uh, that no first-rate university would accept collective bargaining, and no university with collective bargaining would become first-rate. Now, I wonder, I, I, all of what I said mostly 